So now we can bring these pieces together, right? Hopefully you understand we've been laying a foundation. Now it's really important that you understand those pieces. If you're hazy on them, go back, rewind, make sure you understand what's gonna move these around, all right? Now, might be nice to see if we can figure out how to interact these. But the problem, of course, here is what we have on this axis is cost, and what we have on this axis is benefit. We have quantity over here. We have some, we as, as individuals who function in the world, we have some idea that these, these do something together, right? So, something to know, by the way, supply is not a determinant of demand, and demand is not a determinant of supply. Go down those lists. So again, put that list up. We have four, we have number of consumers, or what I'll put is population over here. I didn't forget at that time. What else do we have? We have income, normal and inferior. We have expectations and information about the benefit. We have cost of substitutes, cost of complements, and the one that I think changes very infrequently is preferences. I have almost never have seen a case where preferences really change. Now, I mean, that's not entirely true across my lifespan. When I first started drinking coffee, I didn't like the taste, right? My preferences didn't change. What the reason I started drinking coffee was because I got some information about the benefit of caffeine. It was easier to get up in the morning. It was easier to get rolling, et cetera. Now, 30 years later, I do like the taste of coffee. So it's possible that preferences and palates do change across long periods of time, but typically very seldom in the cases we're going to be looking at. It belongs on the list because it can happen, but it's really quite uncommon. Now over here we have population. In this case, number of suppliers, not the number of people who are currently supplying. Right, same thing over here. We're talking really the population. So how many of you are consumers of Lamborghinis? I suspect none of you are consuming Lamborghinis, but if a Lamborghini sold for a dollar, I think they're probably pretty uncomfortable and pretty silly to have, but I might take one, right? I'd at least try it for a, for a day or two and see, right? So that, again, is the distinction between the number of consumers versus the number of people who are consuming and the number of suppliers versus the number of people who are supply right number of suppliers versus the number of supply we have technology we have cost of inputs we have expectations and information about the cost now we'd like to interact these we'd like to bring them together and the way we can do this is we put in, now we don't want to forget that we don't care about price, what price is going to be a placeholder. We put price in as a placeholder for cost, for consumers, and we could put price in as a placeholder for the benefit to the producers. And what that then means is that we can get wild and crazy, live on the edge here, and we can put these on the same chart. Now don't forget that this here is a placeholder for the benefit to producers and the cost to the consumers. And one of the nice things now with this is that we can start to say, now, if, if you're thinking about, I'm gonna have some assignments and questions for you, and the question, right, we have a situation, uh, let's see, we'll go back to, um, maybe chocolate, right? Let's go to chocolate. Now, let's say that um, research comes out that says that chocolate really helps you learn economics. Is that going to change supply, demand, neither, or both? So that's the, when you're thinking about this, this is how this needs to work. You take the information and you map it on supply, demand, neither, or both. And then assuming it changes either supply, 
demand or both. If it changes neither, then you don't have to do anything from there. That's, that's all the farther you have to go. But if it does affect one of them, then we have to go to the next step, which is then to figure out in which direction will that schedule go, right? So let's say we have chocolate. And ooh, you know, before we get there, let's do this. Here would be one of the questions is, given this supply and demand schedule, what do you think the quantity and the price will be? Hmm. Well, we can try some things. That's one of the nice things here. Let's say this was the price. What would happen? Well, if that was the price, then this would be the quantity supplied, and this would be the quantity demanded. That's what this tells us. And what would that mean in the world? Well, that would then mean that we have people wanting to buy this many goods and people selling that many. That's many, how many are available for sale in the store. What's that look like? In the real world, now tech, in the jargon of economics, that's called a shortage. But in the, jar, in the real world, that, what that is, that's empty shelves, right? That was toilet paper during the COVID crisis. Was, whoo, let's buy all this toilet paper. Now we, and the, one of the questions would be why, right? what happens next? In this situation, what would you expect would happen next? Right? What would you do in response as a consumer? If this was the situation, if you were a consumer of chocolate, you really like chocolate, you go to the shop and you find all oh, the chocolate's gone, what would you do? You go to another store and guess what you would discover? All the chocolate's gone. So what would you do? Eventually, you probably, now this almost, you almost never have to do this. So there's gonna be something we're gonna have to talk about later called entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship. But what you would do is you'd go to the shop owner, wouldn't you? And you say, look, like I did with the butter in Togo, hey, if you bring some more chocolate to the store, I'd like some. And what will they say? No, nah, we're bringing everything we want. Right? At this price, we're bringing all the chocolate we want. Oh, right. If I, brought, if I paid you more, would you bring me more chocolate? Oh, yeah, sure. And so we would expect the price to rise. And what would that happen? That would cause us to get some adjustment out of suppliers. They're going to bring more to market. It will cause us to get some reduction. Some, right? some people go find substitutes. They go do something else. They, they eat uh, nougat instead, right? And what's happened? We've got more coordination. We have more cooperation. Things are starting to work better here. What do we have still? We still have a shortage, but it's smaller. And so now maybe the shopkeeper says, Nah, this worked before. You know what? I'm just going to increase the price. And what happens next? Well, at that point, this here is now the quantity that consumers want to buy at that price. And this here would be the number of chocolate bars for sale. What do we have now? Well, in the jargon of Economics, that's called a surplus. It's a different version of consumer and producer. Those are separate. So this is one of the confusing things. We end up talking about surplus in numerous ways. This here is a surplus of goods. We have unsold goods. That's the way I oftentimes will talk about it because that's how we would, right? We've got stuff rotting on the shelves. We've got chocolate going stale. If you had a bunch of chocolate and you're a merchant, what would you do? What would you expect to happen next? You'd put it on sale. And what happens now? We get some adjustment out of consumers who leave other things for other people and can start consuming more chocolate. And we get a reduction in the number of bars of chocolate available, more coordination and cooperation. Left to our own devices over time, where would we end up? Well, here's where you can play the pirate and you can say, our X marks the spot. But you should understand why. And you'll see why in a moment. We would expect this to be the price and that to be the quantity. Why? Because at that point, nobody has an incentive to change their behavior. This is what we call the market clearing price and quantity. There's neither too little nor too much. There's just the right amount. Now, in the real world, things are moving all the time. We're almost certainly not right there. The point is, this is our best guess, given our information. If, we, if I had to guess where we're going to be, I'd say we're right here. I don't expect us to be right there, 
but that's my best guess. Also, we would expect that um, if we're not there, people are going to have an incentive to change their behavior. They're going to be receiving the information from prices to produce more or less or to consume more or less. And so we are going to tend towards this market clearing price and quantity. Now, let's look at, so market for chocolate, clean this up. Again, that's something I hope you can process. It's really important. This is one of the things we can use in our tools. One of the questions, an interesting extension here would be, you observe an increase in the price. What could be causing that? Well, it turns out it could be three things. It could be a decrease in supply, right? Could be an increase in demand, or it could, could be some combination of both. Now, that may be a little bit too much to digest. So let's rewind here for a moment. And let's just look at the situation I said earlier, that chocolate, right? News comes out that chocolate dramatically helps people study for classes. Well, here's how to work with this. We go down our list here and we say, is this affecting supply, demand, neither or both? Well, we can go down. Is this going to change the population, the number of suppliers? Probably not. Is it changing chocolate technology? Nope. Is that a change in the value that the manufacturers of chocolate could get if they were doing something else, not making chocolate, with their time, energy, and resources? No. Is that changing their information and expectations about the cost? No. Now I see here some of you saying, oh, but wait, I think there would be more chocolate produced. I agree. But remember, demand is not a determinant of supply. So going over here, is this gonna change the number of consumers? No. Is it changing people's income? No. Is it changing the cost of substitutes? No, right? Changing the cost of compliments? No. Is it changing how much people like chocolate? No. So maybe we, it's not changing any, oh, oh wait, yeah. Information that chocolate will help you learn economics probably is going to increase people's expectations about the benefit. And so what happens? At, at this, at this quant for this bar of chocolate, before people expected to get this much benefit, now they're going to get that, they expect to get more. Before they were expecting this much, now they're getting more. And we connect all those dots and we have our new demand schedule. So this was our market clearing price and quantity before anything changed. And now the question is, what happens as a result of this change? Well, first, we have, this is now the quantity supplied and this is the quantity demanded. What is this? This is empty shelves. And so again, what happens? We expect the price to rise. And in this case, for the quantity to go up, leading to our new market clearing price and quantity. So this is bringing these pieces together. So we've got the direction. And then we went, we had another piece here, the change in price and the change in quantity. We can do others here. Let's say instead of this information coming out um, that a new type of uh, a new a new technology for extracting cocoa from the cocoa bean uh, is developed, what's going to happen? Is that going to make people like chocolate more? Is that going to change the number of consumers? Is that changing people's incomes? No. Is it changing the cost of substitutes or complements? No. Is it changing the, the expectations and information about the benefit for the consumers? No. So that then would mean it's not changing demand. How about supply? Oh, oh yeah. You could either put that under technology or cost of inputs. So it's now going to be easier to get... Uh, cocoa out of out of the cop out of the uh, cocoa bean and so it's going to cost less for this bar of chocolate and less for this bar of chocolate connect those dots we have a new supply schedule what happens next well at our initial market clearing price we have 
too many bars of chocolate now. We have a surplus of chocolate. And so what would happen next? We would expect that the price would fall, which would cause some of those people who were not consuming chocolate to consume it, and we would expect some of those suppliers to cut back, leading to our new market clearing price and our new market clearing quantity. So that's how to, how to work with these. That's up through this point. And so definitely get a lot of practice in with this, right? There's a whole bunch of, we can, we can do this with any market. We can do this. We can figure out a whole bunch of stories here. Definitely get some practice in on this. Um, hopefully you understand all the foundations. If you do, we're good. We're gonna add a few more pieces here as we get to some other policies. And even in this situation to ask the question, of is this a good thing or a bad thing?